And next, we're going to have a secret speech from ex-head of White House Press Advance for President Barack Obama, Johanna Masca. Johanna, currently the CEO of Global Situation Room. Thank you. I don't know how secret the speech is going to be. Um, I, I know we're here to talk about uh, blockchain. And uh, first, I want to just thank the hosts of the Block Show conference. I had the opportunity to go, go to the conference in uh, Germany, and it was an awesome experience. Um, I met so many people who wanted to take on big challenges um, and to change the world. And so that's why today um, I want to take a little step back um, to how change happens, uh, to the importance of one voice. Um, you know, I think that we're at the point where we see that we're not that far away from a world where human potential can achieve human, uh, human capital can achieve human potential. To that point where we actually have, regardless of where you're born or who you're born to, you can achieve your potential. Um, and I, uh, to that extent, want to talk a little bit about my story. So it started with one voice, but now we've got this lovely slide. Um, this is uh, my uh, life for eight years. Um, I traveled with President Obama to 42 countries, to almost every state, um, and I set the stage for history. I started at the beginning of the Iowa caucuses, um, back when people were telling me there was no way Barack Hussein Obama would be our next president. Um, and I would go on with him to travel to NATO and to G8 and to uh, APEC and to summits around the world. Um, and in that, uh, I learned a really important lesson about how one voice can indeed change the world. Um, you know, it all started actually in Des Moines, Iowa. I grew up in Galesburg, Illinois. Galesburg, Illinois is a little economically devastated town. President Obama had talked about it in 2004. Um, I was living in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. I had worked in politics uh, both in Kansas and in Iowa, and I wanted to get on the Obama campaign. Um, I'm sure many of you guys know, you know exactly what you want, right? Um, so this story is a little bit about not taking no for an answer. My, uh, uh, the state director, Paul Tews, had moved into Iowa, and I knew that um, they were thinking about potentially running. Um, at the time, President Obama was thinking um, in Hawaii, and uh, I was sure I wanted to work for him. So uh, I met the state director at a party, and I said, where are you going to live? And he said, 10th Street Lofts. And I was like, uh, 10th Street Lofts, that's where I live. Totally true. I'm not a stalker. And uh, so I was like, well, what floor? And he said, the fifth floor. And I was like, that's my floor. So I, I did the very Midwestern thing of welcoming him to town with freshly baked bread every day. To the point where Paul started actually avoiding me and going to the fourth floor, uh, taking the hallway across, taking the stairs up because he knew that I was right by the elevator and I would hear him the minute he would get off the elevator. Because every day he would get home, I would say, I'm going to work for President Obama. I'm going to work for Senator Obama for this campaign. Um, I intend to you know, uh, do this. When are you going to give me my job? And um, uh, at the point, he had no jobs, he had no offices, there was still a decision to be made. Um, so Paul often tells this story and laughs because uh, I would go on, of course, to the White House. Um, I got my job in Iowa. It was a very hopey, changey uh, campaign. Um, but I must say, at the very beginning, there was a lot of skepticism. Um, you know, the truth is, I had these big visions of President Obama. I had seen him in 2004 deliver the convention speech at the Democratic National Convention, and he talked about that world where, um, you know, it doesn't matter your perspective, but we are all working towards this more just, more inclusive, more optimistic, more innovative economy. Um, and I believed in that. Iowans would come to our events, and they would walk away. And they'd be like, eh, yeah, he's OK. Maybe. We could barely get 12 people in seats to see Mrs. Obama. 
and people don't remember that now. They remember like, oh, it was, you know, this amazing, but it was really hard work. I often say to innovators, um, once you're successful, everybody says to you, I always knew you were going to be a success. But at that time, when you're taking the risk, they're like, what are you thinking? Like, good luck ever working in politics again. Um, so at that point in, uh, in Iowa, we had a lot of skeptics. And a lot of people will talk about our tech-savvy campaign and how we engaged people online and that that was how we won. But I actually disagree. Um, this was uh, my vantage point in most events. I was sitting between the stage and the audience um, and watching the president and listening to how it was going. And he was doing these town hall meetings. So then he was the senator, um, not yet the president, and um, he started telling this story. Um, so at first, you know, the, the audience um, was listening to him. He'd do a town hall, they'd leave. Um, he started telling this story about a little lady in a church hat and the story of her uh, shouting, interrupting his speech um, that fired up, ready to go. So he would tell this story um, all over uh, Iowa where he had gone to South Carolina to uh, do this event. And again, there were like 12 people in the room. He was frustrated that he had gone there. He had driven so long, bad paper, bad story in the paper. He was like, why am I even here? And, um, and you know, he's shaking hands, just doing his obligatory work. And uh, this little lady in the church hat in the back of the room is yelling, fired up, ready to go, fired up, ready to go. And the whole room starts chanting, fired up ready to go. And at first he's like, she's showing me up, right? Like, I'm running for president. What's, what's going on here? And uh, he said, you know, before too long, he started feeling kind of fired up. And he started feeling kind of ready to go. And he was telling the story saying, you know, after that speech, he would say to everybody, are you feeling fired up? Are you feeling ready to go? And uh, that voice um, that changed that room changed our campaign. So people at the end of this speech, President Obama would tell this story and he's like, you know, if one voice can change a room, one voice can change a state, one voice can change a nation, and one voice can change a world. What do you think, Iowa? Are you fired up? And Iowans were on their chairs and they are fired up now. And so here we are at the Jefferson Jackson uh, dinner, President Obama, uh, actually this was the Harkin steak fry. President Obama's making fun of me because I'm pushing the press back in front of him um, at this uh, lovely Harkin steak fry. But we had crowds of people. Um, everyone was surprised. So this is the little lady who was in the church hat, Edith Childs. I often say, you know, I love the story of Edith Childs because I don't think it's unlike many of us. This is a woman who wears many hats. She's a city councilwoman. She is, um, I think, a nurse and then also a private detective. And, uh, you know, he would tell this story and kind of giggle about it. But I, I do, I, I often think that that's the story of a lot of uh, people in America and a lot of women in America. Edith Childs. Um, it was an extraordinary experience. I was with the president on election night. Um, I was there the entire day. We went to Grant Park. We won. It was a surreal, um, unbelievable uh, initiation into the world of the White House. Um, so I would go on. This is back in Galesburg, Illinois, my little hometown, wa walking with President Obama um, back to my home. And uh, for those, that time, I was so extraordinarily blessed. Um, I would pinch myself all the time because I never could have imagined uh, this life um, of getting to, to follow a dream and travel the world. Um, it wasn't uh, too long later, um, early in the administration, we went to Copenhagen for the climate change conference. Um, and I was actually one of three people who found a meeting um, that uh, was being held uh, with a different delegation, um, the Chinese, the Indians, the South Africans, and the Brazilians, uh, that were uh, not necessarily on board with the climate change um, 
regulations that uh, others were, Europeans and the US were pushing for. Um, and it was because a lot of people there didn't have power. They didn't have the same extraordinary amenities that many of us are blessed to have in America. And President Obama went to this meeting when he found out about it and sat at that historic meeting for about two hours talking to the leaders about their concerns, listening to the leaders about their concerns, and then talking about the importance of investing on the front end in new technologies that will help revolutionize the lives of all of the people that we have, that we are all, any in government, are responsible enough to look at um, making better. And in that meeting, um, I truly believe he changed the course of history and that now you have a lot of countries um, investing in clean technology and, um, and uh, leading the way um, when we may be taking a little step back uh, right now here in America. Um, you know, I have a friend uh, who tells me, um, Lorna Johnson, she says, her mom said, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think that that's right. Um, you know, we were the dreamers. This is our little team in the White House at the Christmas party. We were the dreamers. We were the believers. And when I look back at uh, my time in the White House, the only times I regret is when I didn't use my voice. Um, the times that I used my voice, I don't often regret. And so to that extent, you know, we we didn't realize a lot the role models that you are for the world. And I think that when you are successful at changing the world, um, that you have to remember that that to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, it is why I am very interested in this blockchain community. I'm very interested in the dreams of the people around the world. And I'm very interested in trying to make that more just world. Um, you know, I uh, had my son, I was running NATO NG8, um, we were hosting at Camp David and in Chicago, and then I was in Afghanistan seven weeks after I delivered my son for a live address to the nation um, on the one year anniversary of the death of Osama bin Laden. Um, I often say of all the cool things I did, which it was an extraordinary experience. I got to fly over Petra and I got to tour the pyramids with President Obama. I went to see Nelson Mandela's prison cell with President Obama. I saw Gandhi's um, home with President Obama. To all of those extraordinary things I got to do, having my child was the best thing I've ever done. And I think those of you who are parents or you know, recognize this hope and the inspiration that our children give us, we realize the big dreams they have. Um, the big dreams that they have to uh, have that moment um, where they can dream those big dreams and they can succeed. Um, you know, this is my son. He was completely convinced he wanted to be a firefighter. And um, in my time, I went around with President Obama and the thousands of times he was asked to sign something, he would always say um, three words, dream big dreams. And so to you, this block show community, I hope that you do dream those big dreams. I hope that you achieve them. And I just have one question. Are you fired up and are you ready to go? Um, I, I think I actually have a few minutes for questions, so I will do this little catch box. Now, I am the um, test case, I guess, and I'm supposed to throw this out in the audience. Anyone have a question? Anyone have a question? No one has a question. Ah, you've got a question. <laughs> I, 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 I only heard Trump. <laughs> I get that question a lot, but let's, let's get his question and then your question. When will I break bread for Trump? Bake bread for Trump. Um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, I uh, left the White House in 2015 and, and uh, I saw my role as getting back into the communities and working on big problems. 
Um, I, I am of the belief that we've gone two steps forward and one step back, and that we have a lot of change and that America is better than some of uh, what uh, Trump is doing right now. What's your question? Uh, while Obama was in office and while you were working for him, was Bitcoin or blockchain anything that was ever mentioned? And if so, what was the atmosphere like if it ever was yeah. mentioned? You, you've got a really good question because, um, points. yes, points. He's got points. He asked if uh, blockchain was mentioned. And in fact, there were a lot of people in our Office of Innovation who were actually paying attention to financial technology and some of the innovations. And some of them actually have gone back into districts and have run for office and even done uh, ICOs for their candidacy. Um, I, I don't think, um, you know, and we'll be talking later about regulations and things. I don't think people should shy away from regulations. I think people should be working with people in government. And I think there are a lot of people who are very interested in that technology. I will say that I learned a lot more about it when I got outside of drinking from the fire hose every single day of another national security crisis or whatever we had. Do you want to ask or did I answer? Did I? Okay. Yeah. Of course, of course. Anyone else? Oh, yep. I have to I have to actually test my tossing here. <laughs> Question for you. Yeah. Sir, make sure you hold the black circle <laughs> right next to your mouth so they can hear you. Oh. Fancy. Yes. Hold yeah. the black circle right up next yeah. to your face and talk into it. All right, awesome. <laughs> so thanks so much for your talk. And the question is that you said to whom a lot of given, yeah. a lot is asked something like that. Sorry for To whom much is given, much is expected. Thank you. So, but don't you think that do you think that you should be given to those who already have and can change something or you should give more to the people who need it the most, right? So we're talking about those poor countries. Yeah. Do you think it's going to make more change globally if we focus on the more developed countries, giving them so they can develop even further, or we give it more to the underdeveloped countries so they can grow and be maybe on the lower level but still progress? Thank you. So, so thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I think that there are people around the world with big ideas and um, that capital can help them realize it. And so I think it's a really important question that we ask ourselves, uh, what are we funding? Are we funding those who um, are in our community because we already know them and we trust them to develop something? Or are we funding those big ideas and taking some risks? Um, you know, with President Obama, he started different programs around the world with um, uh, Young African Leaders Initiative, Young Asian Leaders Initiative, Young Latin American Leaders Initiative. Um, and we worked to harness some of that energy in uh, all sorts of uh, developing countries. And I think it would be a shame if we don't um, give people the power to um, solve a lot of the problems that they realize every day. It's the idea of X Prize, right? If you solve a problem for a billion people, um, you, you know, undoubtedly will um, benefit from that, but also you've solved a problem for a billion people. Um, it's, it's um, you know, I think that, that we um, need education and some of the fundamentals in some places, you know, really around the world, including, um, you know, right here in the U.S., I think uh, some of our technology uh, education needs to be improved. Um, but when folks have good ideas, giving them those resources and those steps and saying to them, this is what I need you to do to, you know, help give me the confidence that I can fund this idea and this is how I want to work with you to bring about that idea, that mentorship is invaluable. And I think that that is uh, something that we all have to look outside of our comfort zone sometimes for those good ideas, uh, mentor them, fund them, believe in them, and realize them. Any other questions with my little mic box here? We didn't have any questions for wom women. M President Obama used to say, boy, girl, boy, girl. Ah, I've got I've got someone with a question. I don't know that I'm going to be able to get this box all the way back there, though. <laughs> I was told specifically not to kick it. <laughs> so here, ah, uh, let's see. Oh, ah, oh, we almost got it. We almost got it. <laughs> I'm not terribly athletic. 
Um, so we, we have a fundamental problem, uh, not having enough women in this space, as you well know. Um, what is your advice for women, first of all, in the space, and then women who are not in the space, as to how we get more women in, and then why? Why we should? Yeah. So, so I say often that uh, women literally birth the future. And I think it's extraordinarily important for women and men to work together um, to uh, change the world. So um, uh, to the extent that it's important to um, uh, be cognizant of your team and making sure that you have diverse opinions, it actually will benefit you long term because you're going to have a product that appeals to a more diverse audience. So I am of the mindset, and I often say that we actually did work to consciously diversify. So um, even within an area where a lot of people from all sorts of different walks of lives were attracted to President Obama, it was important to consciously put that forward and make sure that your team is reflective of the diverse communities that you want to serve. And certainly as a business, it's in your business interest to serve those more diverse communities so that you have increased revenue and you can sell more product. Um, you know, in terms of uh, educational programs, I, I think it's both, you know, yes, we have to do the STEM and STEAM and, and uh, include women, but I also think there are a lot of women out there who can be brought into the community. Um, for example, I spoke at a technology conference in uh, Dublin and was invited time and time again to different conferences, and that invitation is really important to people from around the world. Um, and so I think that it's, uh, it's, it's multifaceted. When you are in the privileged position of setting up a company, make sure you are looking for the best talent from every different walk of life, and you can often find people from every different background, every different gender, um, and work with them. And then the other side is, you know, um, when we as uh, female leaders, um, are speaking to women who are at the beginning of their careers or at a point where they're looking at new changes, we can tell them, you know, look at some of these new technologies that could really change the world. Get involved early. But I appreciate the question. Does that answer it? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. One more. Oh, can you hand it off? <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. That was an awesome throw. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I was just actually wondering, uh, kind of what, what's your stake in the game? Like, I know you said you were in Germany. So yeah. what brought you to uh, blockchain technology? Are you hodling? You know, what? what, what <laughs> <laughs> so, so I uh, actually started paying attention to FinTech, HealthTech, and GovTech when I left the White House um, for the reason that uh, I think a lot of those areas are um, uh, areas that you can have terrific impact with technology. Um, and so I had already uh, started to get interested in the financial technology community. I will be completely honest that um, because of some of the issues with Bitcoin and um, some of the uh, trading that's done on, you know, maybe not necessarily the best of cases, there's a lot of skepticism uh, from those of us who have been in government. Um, a, a healthy, I think, skepticism probably. And so uh, I, I joined these communities to learn more, to do exactly what we were just talking about, to learn more, um, to realize, you know, those who have big dreams and could uh, have big impact um, in the fintech, uh, govtech, and uh, health tech spheres, because I think that could really change our dynamics. Anyone else? I am so, oh, I think I do have another question over here. I'll take the box back and throw it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Did I answer? I think you did. <laughs> I tried to. All right. Here we go. OK, let's see how I do here. I'm going to try. <laughs> awesome. Uh, solid throw. <laughs> so uh, my question is, uh, how do you see the blockchain affecting uh, the developing world, like in Africa? So uh, how do you see the barrier of entry into things like government being reduced? Yeah. Um, and to that extent, are you talking about uh, in terms of developing countries that may not have as, uh, as advanced governments? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, how do you see uh, smart contracts affecting government, especially in developing countries? So like, um, yeah. 
pretty much the cost of running a government going down. How do you how do you see that being achieved in the future? Yeah, and um, you know, I know I've got some friends in this space who talk about this a lot, and this space of saying, um, you know, with these kinds of smart contracts, it can uh, rid us from some of the corruption. Exactly. Uh, that uh, one may have gotten accustomed to having to deal with. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely agree that um, some of those uh, technologies can help. But as m one of my friends has said more times than not, um, you have to really read the fine print of those contracts, too, because once you sign it, it's y you signed it, right? Yeah. So um, I don't think that, um, that we can whole wholly trust, um, you know, that all people in any sector, whether it's technology, are all out for everyone's good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so to that extent, I think there's going to have to be some, um, you know, like consumer protections. I'm obviously of the mindset of consumer protections. Now, right now, in developing countries, you don't have governments enforcing a lot of these uh, laws, which it, it twofold, then t people could take advantage of that, which I don't want to see. And people could actually uh, use that to help lift communities up out of a situation where they've been a uh, victim to uh, corruption. And my hope is that those who uh, really care about it will go in and um, help uh, try to l create that transparency so that people there are not taken advantage of. Does that make sense? I kind think so. Kind of? <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for everything you've done so far. It's amazing, you know, the path you've been on. Um, my question is this. Um, is there anything during that entire time that you spent with uh, Obama and the things that you've done that you, some of the things that you wish you hadn't done that you would have done? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we weren't perfect. And anybody who tells you that they're perfect um, I don't know, I guess um, I wouldn't believe them. I uh, have done a little bit of this, you know, back and forth with uh, politicians on punditry type w work, and I'm asked that question a lot. I mean, I think a lot of people looked at President Obama and they thought that he was going to be able to solve a lot of problems, and we had a lot of problems on our plate. Um, but when you're in the White House, you end up drinking from the fire hose, and it's a lot of reactionary instead of, uh, instead of being able to set the agenda that you want. Um, I think businesses are actually in the position of being able to set the agenda that they want more often. Um, and so I think it actually is incumbent on all of us to bring about the change. So one of the things that I look back on is I realize that a lot of times people were like, okay, President Obama's got this, right? He's going to change the world, and we're just going to hang out. And, um, and I don't think that that's how change happens. I think that we needed to um, explain ourselves better on uh, some of the initiatives that we were putting forth. We did not uh, do signature health care or signature uh, immigration reform. Health care wasn't perfect. We need a lot of improvement. But the, the point is that you're, you're moving in that arc towards um, that more perfect union, towards justice. We're not there yet. We're a long way from there. But I think we need to be more inclusive and go back to our core, which our motto was respect, empower, include. And I think that that's going to be really important for our path forward, to his point, um, even you know, with what's going on right now, some of the backlash in Washington. I have 46 seconds left. One last question, or are we? Uh, yes, one last question. Back. Oh, did I answer? Thanks for being so humble. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> it was a good throw. <laughs> Good morning. I just had you. I thought I heard you say something about um, candidates and running for office and using ICOs yes. to fund them. Could yeah. you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, actually, in California, uh, Brian Ford, who was in our um, Office of Innovation uh, and Technology Policy, um, uh, invited me to a number of ICOs um, and uh, was involved in that. Now, this is a space where it's going to be heavily regulated in the U.S., of course, because uh, campaign finance is um, really important. It's a debate that we go into all the time. But um, there are, unfortunately, he lost his primary. 
Um, but he, he was starting um, down that path. And I think that you're seeing a lot of people who are interested, and I know we'll speak on a panel later today, um, I think it's at 11, uh, about um, building democracy uh, with blockchain technologies. And it, uh, I know that um, on our call beforehand, it's come up that there are a number of people who are running for office with the perspective from blockchain. And I think that's actually going to be crucial for blockchain's full application in government. Um, I think that's it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you.